everybody. We are live. This Google Hangout is live. We are also actually not live on the podcast, which is technically going to be going up tomorrow. So welcome to our listeners. Welcome to our viewers. For those who are just coming into the mix, I'm Sarah Herring. We've got Brent Harrington. Say what's up. Yo, what is up? I'm actually trying to get into the chat real quick. No, I know. It's like I'm staring at the thing trying to make sure I can get into the chat because I know we have some people that hang out in there. Yeah, you get in the chat, you monitor the chat, but most importantly, we have actually an old friend of mine, one of the first people I met in poker before I was really in poker, Johnny Moreno, also known as Johnny Vibes. We were just talking about this a little bit earlier. I'm a big fan of an alter ego. Everyone knows my name is Anti Chardonnay, so I love it. And welcome to the show, my man, Johnny. Thank you. I feel like it's a long time coming with how long a relationship has been. Was the first trip that I met you on a trip to the cop or to the bicycle? Potentially. Oh my gosh, that was so long ago. <laughs> that was your first time ever doing poker related stuff, right? Yeah, that was my I first time. You, you were telling me that you were an actress and you were thinking about getting into the media side of things. And it was that was an <laughs> ugly period for everyone. And also the bike. Wow. <laughs> I like awesome. that you call it the bicycle. <laughs> I was actually there at the bike yesterday. I saw your tweet live at the bike, right? Last night. Uh huh. It, uh, so it been streaming. I mean, I've seen you on live at the bike lots of times and that's something I want to get into more, but before we get too much into our just casual convo, I want to make sure to bring the audience up to speed. Now they know that we're old friends, which is great. They also may or may not know that your sister-in-law is Christy Arnett and mm -hmm. your brother is Andrew Moreno, who I, Yes. slipped the name in nice and easy yesterday uh, way too used to saying amo but talk to us a little bit first just to give people a timeline about your coming into poker your discovering poker if they watch your vlogs even in the very early stages you explain sort of your journey but for those who haven't seen them yet let's talk about how you got into the, the poker space yeah definitely i think it's like so fitting that you called me Andrew Moreno on last week's podcast because I have been living in the shadow of Andrew Moreno and Christy Arnett for my entire poker existence. And I've been okay with it. They are obviously my favorite people in the world. And as a cash game player, not being on the tournament circuit, you're largely under the radar in general. You know, I'm obviously not in it for the fame. I'm grinding out a living. It's, it's dirty work in general, but <clears throat> so yeah. Um, the only reason that I have been successful and have been able to make it this far in poker, honestly, is because of people like Andrew Christie and the relationships that they had in their life. And they brought those relationships into my life. So becoming a failing poker player wasn't really an option for me because I, I had to represent the Mo family and like all the people in the circle were like, they were crushers. And I was just this guy that was trying to figure things out. And if I didn't figure things out, I wasn't going to be able to hang out with them. So that was that was the whole goal of it was scratching out a living for myself and being able to hang out with all the people that they got to hang out with. It's so funny because I can remember talking to Christy about, you know, that you had actually come from a background of, I want to say tech or that you had actually had a real job with like a real 401k and yep. were, you know, sort of what they perceived as being a real adult. And that no, actually it was such a gamble I, for you. Even when I was, well, even when I did have a real job and I had a 401k, you know, when you check the boxes on how risky you want to be with that 401k, I always check the riskiest box. So <laughs> Let's gamble. Let's gamble. the roots were there, right? <laughs> yeah, but no, seriously, when I was, uh, I mean, I, I can't, I, I was going to school during the dot com era and I was going to be an engineer and like everyone was like, oh, you got to go into computer science because dot com is where the money's at. I was really just chasing the money, using my math skills and chasing software development. And then I did that. I was in my mid twenties, uh, writing software for a company. Like I wrote an ordering system for a hardware store, you know, so that I was sitting in a cubicle for nine hours a day, just pounding out code with no like windows, just no social interaction. And obviously, you know, me, and that's just not me. Like the math part of it was me. The logic part of it was me, the, the figuring out new problems every single day that aren't the same day to day. That was me but the not communicating with people and not being social, that wasn't me. And Andrew was my brother, 19, was playing online poker. Chris Moneymaker is what got him into online poker. And he pretty early on was having success, 
And he was coming to me about it. He's like, bro, I'm having so much success playing online poker. And I, I didn't even know what beat what, you know, like I, it was just like this thing that was gambling to me. And I was like, okay, but how's school going? Oh, I dropped out. Yeah, no, you need to go back to school. Forget this poker thing. And he, one day I remember specifically, I was sitting in my cubicle and he just started forwarding me, congratulations, you have placed first place in a tournament. Those sit and goes, he just started forwarding them to me over and over. And I got like a hundred emails from poker stars that said, congratulations, you just finished first place in a sit and go. And then I get home and I'm like, what the hell happened today? And he's like, oh, look, look at my poker stars account. I had this much to start the day and now this much to end the day. And I was like, show me what you're doing. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> something to this thing. I so, I mean, before I even invested a single dollar into poker, I had already had someone that was super successful in poker that was training me. And I would come home after work and he, he was, I was just watching his hands and I'm like, why did you raise there? Why did you call here? Why did you re-raise there? He was explaining things like, big blinds and all this other things that, and I'm just like, okay, so what do you have in relation to the board? You know? <laughs> and it just grew from there where like it, my curiosity, I deposited my own and then it was, he was mentoring me along the way. And he actually met Christy in the same town and Christy was really big into it too. So because I have such a tight knit relationship with my brother, uh, I, I don't, I mean, you know this, but like he's been my best friend my whole life. And Christy is basically my sister. There was, no option for me you know i had to i had to explore what they were exploring which is, i mean this is ultimately ultimately what has led me to where i'm at now because christy and andrew went on this big self-improvement kick and they were like doing all these workshops and figuring out their purpose and what their vision was and what kind of legacy they were going to leave and i'm just sitting over here playing 510 being like where are we going this weekend so you know? <laughs> And so I had to grow with them, you know, like if I wanted to be, if I wanted to be on the same wavelength as them, the same energy, the same vibe, you might say, <laughs> I, had, <laughs> I just had to, uh, I had to follow in their footsteps. So that's what I did. I started, Christy, you know, had her podcast. I was an avid listener of her podcast and she really started opening up my mind to, you know, what's my legacy? What's my purpose? You know, what, what am I building for the future? And poker is great. I love poker. But I wanted to have something on the side that was more legacy based, that was more like my stamp on the world. Like this is this is who people are gonna look back and say, Oh, Johnny Vibes, yeah, he was he was a good poker player, but he also did this for the world and he created this. And so that was how Deep Vibes came about. I I um you can't tell right now, but I have impeccable style. Right now I'm just wearing a t-shirt. This is true um, though, I can confirm. <laughs> Story checks out. And um I was I like I was consuming all these documentaries. No, oh, never eating an animal again. Oh, never buying a clothes, never buying clothes from China anymore. You know, <laughs> like I, I mean, I went full blown hippie. I've scaled back a little bit because it has to make sense for me in my daily life. And because you have to have style still. Yes, I mean, <laughs> social consciousness is great uh, unless the shoes are cute. Then it's like, <laughs> <laughs> now, all joking aside, though, it did become a really big deal for me, and I wanted to have my own brand because I couldn't find what I liked that like I could check the boxes off. Oh, made in America. Oh, made organically. Oh, the workers got paid $15 an hour. Check, 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 check. Like, and, and I like it. Like that just wasn't happening for me. So I was like, I'll just make my own brand and create some t-shirts and then just what I like. And then I was like, okay, now let's put them on a website and see if they sell. Didn't sell. No, I mean, this is, it's a really saturated market. And actually this is something, and obviously we're going to get more in depth into, you know, the life of grinding and all this other gamble, but starting a business is a gamble in and of itself. And I, was it, did you basically f just fully fund it yourself essentially? And yeah, hundred percent from the ground up your own baby. Yeah, it's a hundred percent. I have a hundred percent equity in the company myself and, um, interesting poker related story. I was at a, 4th of July party on the eve of the main event a couple years ago. And everyone was drunk and everyone was trading like, did you guys hear that? Yes. Yeah, sorry. I don't know how to, anyways, everyone was like trading percentages for the main event. And I had sent out some text messages to trade for the main event. And I remember I was drunk on an airplane right before this party. And I sent a text to Max Steinberg and I was like, you want to swap for the main event? Please. And he just like, he, I think he did like a thumbs up. 
yeah. it wasn't even like a confirmed or whatever. I need to, okay, you guys need to stop texting me right now. Yeah, why are you? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, I see you uh, on the sorry. YouTube. Um, so yeah, so he like gave me a little thumbs up for swapping and he ended up getting fourth place or third place or something like that. And Which was such an amazing moment even. And I can remember asking him, you know, what was the best part of the experience for him? And he broke down and said that sharing it and being able to share it with his friends and family was like by far the, the best part. So it's also, it was a literal, like sharing the moment, but also a literal, like sharing <laughs> the yeah. money. Definitely. And I, I had a big piece of that. And when I got a chunk of that money, I was like, what am I going to do with this? I can reinvest it in my bankroll and like keep playing bigger or doing things like that. But this is when I was on that kick of, you know, what, what's my legacy going to be? So I took a bunch of that money and funded deep vibes. It's interesting because obviously you're not going to, you're no expert clearly in the clothing industry um, outside of these very good documentaries that you've watched. So what, <laughs> what are the steps to try to figure out? Like, where does what, like, are you just like Google, like U S based clothing manufacturer? <laughs> How do you even I, start? So think about a beginning poker player and what they do when they're trying to figure out poker. They're like, what book do I buy? They're like, maybe I'll get Phil Hummuth's book. Cause he's like the biggest guy. Bad advice. Sorry. Sorry, Phil Hummuth. <laughs> But the point is, is that like, I was just grasping for straws, you know, like I was doing the same thing, Google, like these places, they don't advertise on Google and there's no footprint for these manufacturers. So I was, I was grasping for straws and I didn't know anybody. So it was, it was just one of those things where I just had to figure it out along the way and then slowly make connections. And, you know, now I have definitely some people around me that know a lot about the space and. I have people that are creating content for me for free, modeling for me for free. So at first that would that would never happen, but it was just a process. Same as poker. Now, in terms of your individual style, I'm just throwing this out here before we get into the poker because I have a freakishly long torso. This is something we've talked about lots of times on the <laughs> podcast. It's you know, some people are legs for days. I I'm like tall on the top and it's funny because i think a lot of the clothes that you have i see them and i'm like that is exactly what i need it's the the tops that are longer and that you can wear with whatever kind of style pants you want without showing your belly off and where did, i guess sort of where did you come up with the the concept and some of yeah. the ideas for this it's a really original style i think yeah so um one of the things that I, was important to me is that i noticed that my wife olga and our styles were kind of like merging uh, like, I don't know if that, if you notice that with your husband where you Standard. just kind of, yeah, exactly. And I, what I wanted was something that would be durable, something that was better for the environment. There's no perfect solution for the environment right now. Something that was better for the environment and something that could be traded back and forth between Olga and I. So every time that I would come up with something, I would wear it. I'd be like, I like this. All right, Olga, put it on. How's it going to look on you with some like boots? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, the whole idea was I want to do something unisex something that lasts, something high quality, something made in the United States. Well, one of your newer projects, I think, it, are you on vlog 16? Yep, I just uploaded vlog 16 yesterday. So 16 vlogs, um, the space of vlogging, I mean, the space of YouTube, as I'm sure you're becoming more familiar, is something that changes all the time. And I, I think we've spoke about it on the podcast, but if not, they changed the algorithm in the last year. They're you know, the whole concept, the idea is to just keep people on YouTube as long as possible. And, but I think the space is so, uh, I had a presentation from someone from YouTube last week and he was saying that every single second there is, you would have every single second, the amount of video content that is uploaded on YouTube, you would live until you were 83 just to see all the content that's uploaded in one second. One second. It's insane. Wow. That is, that, that's insane. Yeah. So it's a the space is really competitive, and also someone who doesn't come from a you know film television background. I mean, even people who do, it's really hard. But your content is really unique. It seems very much like you know what you're doing in the in the editing space. Even the thumbnails look really great. So talk to me a little bit about the first of all the inspiration for the vlog, and secondly the how you're figuring out how to do it so well. Okay. Yeah. So. Back to what I was saying, when I put all these clothes on the website, nobody bought anything. And I was like, why, why is nobody buying anything? So then I started really immersing myself into marketing. And marketing was this whole big game of you know, influencer marketing and paid advertising. And I, I was getting like lost in this world. And I was like, what I figured out was 
the best thing in my space was influencer marketing. So I was contacting influencers on Instagram and that was, I was having some success with that, but <clears throat> deep down, they weren't my brand. They were someone that was wearing my brand. So as close as I could get to them being my brand, they weren't truly indicative of what the brand represented. represented. So I was like, you know what? I have some editing skills. I want to work on my storytelling. I'm not great with my elevator pitch. I'm not great in front of the camera. I mean, I'm, I don't know if you looked at the first vlog, but I'm just like so monotone. I'm like, like, I'm not me on the camera. So I was like, I need to become me when I'm in the business world. So I'm going to do something that's outside of my box. I've always been on this side of the camera. I'm going to put myself on the other side of the camera, really stretch my comfort zone. I feel like there's going to be a lot of room for growth for me. And the other thing is that I think that if I tell a good enough story, people are going to connect to me and they're going to like me because I think I'm likable. <laughs> if they know the me, if they know the real me, if they connect with me, I think what's going to happen is they're going to buy into the brand and they're going to want to support me. So I went into it with no expectation of, you know, this is going to convert into dollars. It just was, I just want to provide value for, for people and sh show people who I really am and then build build a community so that I'm the influencer because if I'm the influencer, it's my brand. So my brand is 100% me. And I feel like the influence is just so authentic in that way. It's so true. You know, I think what one of the most interesting things about it, actually when the YouTube people came in and spoke to us, they were, spoke, they were speaking about the numbers actually and how people are some ridiculous percentage that I can't remember, but more likely to purchase something that's recommended by a you know, influencer on YouTube than they are from a celebrity. And I think it's really cool for us to have taken back this, you know, brought the the power of marketing back into the hands of real people who really try things and really connect with people. And I think for, for you, especially, this is something I've talked about. I've been working with some different vloggers and trying to help them build their own channels is something that I think is the biggest struggle for everyone is trying to be themselves. It's very difficult, I think, for people to just show their true self out there. And so let's talk a little bit about, I guess, your true self. What is uh, what what makes your vlog different than Andrew Nimi or Doug Polk or, you know, Mr. Owen? What what uh, what does it look like? OK, so I think that what separates my vlog from other people's vlogs is I am 100 percent willing to be 100 percent honest and and vulnerable about how I'm feeling. And I remember <clears throat> everyone says content is king. Content is king. Create good content and people will come. And you don't even have to like spend the money. But like that wasn't working for me on Instagram. I was creating these great great videos and like nobody would show up on Instagram. So I I but YouTube was so funny because like I didn't spend a single dollar and the YouTube algorithm just figured out that my people wanted to see my content. And it, it really happened and it just like shot to the top. So like if somebody did watch Andrew Nimi's video, my video would be directly under them because YouTube was like the ratio of how long people are watching this video with how often they're liking it with, um, you know, those metrics. We think that they're going to want to see your video right after Andrew Nimi's. So I went from, I had like 300 followers, but then my video would get like 20,000 views like pretty instantly like without me even spending a dollar. So I was a little bit baffled by it, but I realized what happened was there was one episode where I lost like a lot of money. I lost 6,500 ish in three hours. And then I went and immediately recorded what happened. And like, I wasn't like, there was no like, I'm cool. It was like, I'm the worst ever. Like I'm my, I'm proud. Like my mindset is a little fragile right now. Like I, I blew up and, and like I even, like had pain, like there was real pain in the video. I think people, a lot of people connected to that and they're like, how come on on these other blogs, everyone wins a thousand or $2,000 every single time they play. And I'm like, <laughs> the truth, <laughs> that's crazy. I thought but it was interesting. I'm not any other vloggers out, but what I'm saying is that I was just so willing to go to a place that, uh, and even like my most recent vlog, Olga cries in my most recent vlog. You know? Oh, I haven't seen it, need to see, I'm watch now. <laughs> See you guys later. Tears. The, the point is, is that like, I'm just not afraid to show who I really am. And I'm not afraid to be vulnerable or weak or, or, or I, I was actually putting a lot of hands where I was playing bad too. 
And I think that, because I think there's a lot of value in analyzing the spots where you play bad rather than like, this is where I played great and learned from this. I think, especially for me, when, when I make a big mistake, there's way more value in, in studying that mistake. So, yeah, I think that what it came down to, the reason why I was able to game the system was, was just being vulnerable and honest and t- like having great pride in the edits that I was making and like being kind of a perfectionist when it came to the storytelling and not just, uh, not just spouting off hand histories. This is like every episode is, is tr- I'm trying to tell a story. And I think another thing that, sets me apart too is I've been playing cash game poker for a long time. I play a little bit higher than a lot of the other bloggers. And when I talk about my hands, I'm actually talking about my thought process. I'm not saying he raised me, I called, then on the turn I check, he moved all in and I called. I'm saying he raised me, what would he be raising me with? I think that he has this many combinations of value. I think he has this many combinations of bluff. This is how big the pot is. I have to be right this many times. Like I'm actually walking through all of this on camera it actually helps me too. Like the the more you can articulate poker, I think the better you become at it and the more clear your thoughts are in the game. And it, and it's funny because some people are good at talking about that and some people aren't, especially for me, you know, it's something I ask people all the time, analyze a hand, take me from A to Z, everything. What did you think they have? All this. And s- some people really, you know, nail it and some people not so much. And I can even remember when I first met Andrew and and Christy and you as well and listening to the way you guys spoke about poker and just knowing for myself, okay, I'm never going to be, I'm like, I'm not that guy. I'm not going to be that guy, which is fine. But it's funny because something that I really learned from you and I guess in the vein of this real honesty and openness, something I really saw from you guys was a lot of the pain that goes into being a professional cash game poker player. A lot of the swings and the real emotional ups and downs. And I think it's something people super, super often when we have, you know, open forums, open Q and A's will ask, how do you deal with swings? How do you deal with tilt? And part of just seeing, knowing that sometimes people are going to feel depressed when they lose a lot of money. I think people have a hard time being real about that and recognizing it. So talk to us just a little bit about what the struggles, I guess, of being a cash game grinder for as long as you have been. Uh, definitely. So this is definitely a process too, because at first it was going into my bedroom and watching Netflix and disconnecting and sleeping an extra hour or two. And yeah, exactly. And so there's no shortcut to being good at this to really managing your emotions i think that for me like i've always been a more even person so i was more inclined to be able to handle it but even even myself like at the beginning it was it was tough and when people ask how do i deal with it the secret is time you have to go through it and you have to you have to experience it yourself and work through it on your own. So like, there's no magic pill that I'm gonna be able to give you that says, here, take this, and then you'll be able to deal with the swings. It's actually like going through it in the trenches and experiencing it for yourself. And over time, you'll just get better at it. A lot of people don't get better at it and then they end up quitting or they'll blow off money. But if you're gonna survive in poker, you have to get better at it. So I know that you primarily play 510, but that you also have played some bigger stakes, much bigger stakes, in fact. And I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, when you make those choices to take those swings, when you decide you like, it doesn't make sense to be doing that. I think a lot of players are always trying to figure out if they're playing the right stakes or if they're ready, or if this game is like juicy enough that it makes sense. So talk to us a little bit about how you make those decisions. Yeah. Okay. So I think a lot of this is personality based and I generally have a more reserved personality. So it was. It took me a little bit longer to climb the stakes because I wanted to be sure that I was going to win when I went to the next level. And in poker, you can never be sure about anything. So at some point, you are going to have to take a leap of faith. And definitely, I've taken some some steps and gotten crushed. And it, it's just a process of getting crushed and going back down in stakes and rebuilding your confidence and then getting going back up again. And I had... Before, I had to be really careful with bankroll management because I, if I was, if I lost all of my money, like there was, there was no option. I couldn't get back in the game. Like, am I going to go to my mom and say, 
mom, can I borrow $20,000 because I lost it gambling? You know, like it just wasn't going to work. So I had to be really safe. But then once I started to move up in stakes and Andrew and Christy started to move up in stakes and I started to build a circle of people around me that were really like crushers, it allowed me to take more risk because even if I lost all my money, my good name and my borrowing power was in the six figures. So it, it, and I did like one time I owed $16,000 to the IRS and I was like, Hey, Andrew, can I get 16 grand so I can pay the IRS? Cause I don't want to like, I need, I need those, yeah, I need this 30 K so I can continue to play five ten. you know? And then, you know, I, I borrowed it, paid him back in like a couple months. But the point is, is that I could, I could afford to be riskier once like I start to build up my name and, and, um, and like, build up my stats and like have something to show that like I'm a long-term winning player. So you've played of course, both in Las Vegas and in San Diego. And this is something we talked about a little bit this summer, just the sort of different scenes in each place. And, you know, some people prefer one over the other, obviously you've chosen San Diego. So mm -hmm. talk to us a little bit about what the, why, why San Diego, why that's where you feel like you need to be. Oh, Vegas will always have a special place in my heart. I, I just absolutely love Vegas. The first time I ever went to Vegas was to visit Andrew and Christy. They had been living there for six months without me, and I was still working back in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And we were, it was Memorial Day weekend, and I had a drink in my hand, and we were on the strip, and it was just 75 degrees out. It felt amazing. And I was, I, I was captivated. And I had to get on a plane and fly back. And I, I got on the plane, flew back, quit my job, and like came back. Like it, it was that, I, I just loved it. So Vegas will definitely always have a special place in my heart. And I started in the lower stakes. And if you are starting in lower stakes, I would totally recommend Vegas because the rake is low there. There's a constant player pool of people coming in to play lower stakes, one, two, two, five. And it's fun, especially if you're single, it's a great place to live. And so it was perfect for me. I had just got out of a relationship. And it was, it was what I needed at the time that I needed to build up my bankroll. And then once I got into the, like the two five area and I wanted to start maybe dabbling in like, you know, $1,500 buy-in games, it, it, it was getting a little bit tougher. And I also saw that in California, there was a little bit more opportunity in this stake level and the rake wasn't killing you as much. So I started taking trips to Oceanside to play Oceans 11 and it went really well right off the bat also at this time I, I was like i really need to settle down like i'm i'm staying up all night and my, my lifestyle is just like getting a little bit out of control like i didn't have any problems gambling or going to strip clubs or anything like that so i wasn't leaking money in those areas but my life ev you know staying up all night sleeping when the sun's blaring through my windows i just wanted to have a more normal lifestyle you know waking up at eight o'clock in the morning going to the gym feeling the breeze off the ocean. I was like, let's try this lifestyle and see if like going to the gym at 10 o'clock in the morning is gonna work for me and not going at midnight is gonna work, you know, like just seeing if it's gonna work. And so I made the move to Oceanside. I actually moved in with high stakes crusher, Brian Kim, and we lived right on the beach in Oceanside, grinded at Ocean's 11 every day, just really took my game to the next level. Went from playing 5-5 up to 5-10. They were running 10 and 10, 20 games there was playing 1020 and it's so it was so amazing to have someone of Brian Kim's caliber living under the same roof as me just bouncing hands off of him and and like that I attribute my success in poker so much to the people that have just been around me so in a nutshell the reason why I moved to California was I thought there was bigger opportunities and bigger games and I thought the lifestyle was more conducive to what I wanted long term and I ended up settling down in California finding a girlfriend and Obviously, I'm married now. You, you helped me get engaged. Thank you for that, Sarah. <laughs> and the wedding pictures were amazing. Well, I don't want to keep you for too much longer, but I do want to talk about, you know, for my own self, something that I really struggle with a lot is just finding balance when you have a ton of projects going on and people are pulling you in a million directions. Also, being married, you know, takes time and energy in a good way. But, you know, all these things. Talk to us about what your life kind of what gets what percentage of time now you obviously have a lot of projects going on and where are you weighing kind of the value of all of them how are you putting what are you putting your time into okay yeah definitely so the way that i spend my day-to-day -day time is like poker wise i always want to play poker while Olga's at work because i feel like 
if we're on a similar work schedule, it's going to create a much better balance in my life when I get to see her when she comes home from work. And if that means me giving up $25 an hour in equity in EV, I'm, I'm totally fine with that because happy wife, happy life. And like, if she's happy, I'm happy, you know? So sure, staying up all night and, and, and playing at the casino would probably be more profitable for me, but it's not, it's not what I want to do. And as far as how much poker I'm playing, I usually play in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 hours a week. And I usually spend in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 hours a week vlog, uh, producing a vlog. And then I spend another um, probably 10 to 15 hours a week creating other content through so throughout my other social channels and uh, for, for my clothing company related tasks with that. And then weekends, Olga and I are on the road all the time. Like we are traveling every single weekend to do something, which is crazy because we live in one of the most beautiful places in the world, but we're both wanderlusters and we just, we love to travel. So yeah. I mean, that I, sounds really balanced though. It's like, yeah. hey, it's, everything gets a, gets a pretty solid share. Yeah, well, I mean, one of my vlogs was titled "Balance is more in po balance is more in po balance is more important in life than it is in poker." So it's it's a theme that I live by, and yeah, it's it's worked really well for me. It's one of the hardest things. I think it's the struggle <laughs> of life trying to find balance. I I definitely moderation has never been my thing. Balance is something I struggle with, but I'm working. I'm getting older. I'm working on it now. Tell, like, let's get a little bit then where people, if this this taste wasn't enough, where can they find you? Where can they follow you? Where do you suggest they go and subscribe and all of this? Yeah, so I am offering a ton of value in my vlogs on YouTube. Um, I, and I knew that if I was going to build a community and if, if I was going to build it in a short amount of time, the only way that I could really do that is if I was providing value for people, big value for people, without anything, without any expectation in return. So that's my whole strategy right now is just provide value. People are always, are you worried about showing your whole cards and talking about your thought process? No, like I'm not worried about it at all. Most of the people consuming my vlogs are in the lower stakes anyways. But in general, like if, if the game becomes harder for me in the higher stakes because I'm giving away all this information, it's fine. I'll figure it out. So yeah, you'll be getting so much value from all your subscribers. You'll be like, I don't even need this game anymore. <laughs> I will make a home game. But yeah, so so I think that that's the best place is through my vlog. And then um, on Instagram, I'm like, if, if one weekly vlog is not enough for you, I'm pretty much on Instagram story every day showing showing you guys my dog and my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and just like in all the fun places that I'm at and all the places that I'm going, uh, I'm getting on a plane tomorrow to go see my dad for the Super Bowl. Then I'm going to the Matrix next week to play in the Bay Area. Um, one of my vlog watchers is taking me to a Golden State Warriors game, and then I'm going to Macau, I'm going to Korea, I'm going to Tokyo, I'm going to um, all these places. I'm friends with uh, Zed the DJ, so I'm going to go see him in Asia at one of his tour stops. We're going to go visit Olga's dad in Russia. I mean, there's just, and I'm taking, I'm taking the camera with me wherever I go. Wow, that's awesome. Well, I, I had one question. Subscribed. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I haven't actually subscribed yet, but I, I guess I have a backlog of videos I can check out. Um, when you decided to start this, um, I know it was like maybe if somebody's listening, this entire community already exists, right? There's vloggers, there's all these people, um, you know, streamers, vloggers, kind of all in the same thing. One of the things that really I think is neat is it's like while it's sort of maybe viewed in some circles as competition, it's almost like supporting each other. It's like it is a community of people who enjoy poker and enjoy making this content. And you're saying like, basically some of your popularity came from the fact that you kind of jived with Andrew's mm -hmm. video and his crowd, and they thought there would be a connection there. Did, did that have anything to do with how you approached it? Was it maybe a, uh, Oh like yeah, a hundred percent. It was definitely part of my thought process. Um, so, I mean, my name is Johnny vibes and the theme of my channel is like hundred percent positive vibes. So, with that said, Andrew, Andrew Nimi is actually a, a relatively good friend of mine. And from the get-go, I was like a fan of his. And I was in his chat saying that he, he was the goat of vlogging and he was inspiring me. And it is a community. It, it, like I have no, I, I want to see other vloggers succeed. 
And it has nothing to do with like competition for me. It's all building each other up and supporting each other. And like that, that's what deep vibes is all about. That's what positive vibes are all about. And, and to be honest, like I'm a fan of his blog. Uh, I'll, I'm going to plug a couple other blogs on here. Jamon Burton. I love that guy. He, he's so funny. He's not a professional poker player, but he plays poker and he's funny. So like, I, I just, I want to support these people. These people in turn support me. He bought one of my hoodies. Wait, what's so, his first name? Jamon. Jamon? Jamon. Jamon, sorry. Jamon. 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 Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point is, is that there's no competition in my eyes. It's it's all, it's a community of people. And, and um, I don't look at anything that Andrew does as competition. I look at it, at it as providing value for me and inspiring me. Awesome. Wow, That's there's really a exciting. full-on ghetto bird outside of my apartment. Can you guys hear that? I'm sorry. Oh, no, somebody was like chainsawing something outside my window for a brief moment there, I think. Alive. Well, <laughs> I appreciate you so much taking the time. And actually, I haven't seen the latest vlog, so I got to get up in there and see Olga cry. I don't. I hope it's a happy cry. I hope it's a good one. <laughs> it's definitely a good one. Good. Is there, is there, has there been a chat going on right now? I don't know. I, I don't uh, there know. were a few people in chat, but uh, there was the only question was like a joke question. How do I stop losing with pocket aces every time? And then you did a little winky face. So I thought that was, that was pretty funny. I mean, unless you have the answer to that question, which I, I don't know. And I don't ever want to talk <laughs> about how to effectively play jacks or king oh. queen or <laughs> suited. Oh or like, I'm never there's, asking these questions. As soon as I started my channel, I started getting blown up by Instagram direct messages. So I had jacks. Oh. <laughs> Every single time. I'm Thomas O'Toole says thanks for the interview, JV. So there we, I mean, we did have some chat. There were people watching. It wasn't, a, it was a shy chat, shy chat. Uh, so, uh, you know, one of the ways that I've been battling with this, how do I play Jack's thing is I created a Facebook group where people that were really interested in strategy could go in there. And it was a community of people that were allowed to post hand histories in this group. And I would go in and comment what I thought the optimal play was on their hand histories. And it was community people of supporting each other and the people that were providing the best insight and the best feedback, I was giving them like rewards. Like one, one guy I made a moderator. This summer, I'm probably going to end up staking one of my vlog watchers. So I'm definitely- it's very much the future. By the way, it's interesting because obviously you said for whatever reason, the metrics of YouTube were working with what you were doing. And I actually just went to a conference um, with a bunch of Facebook people who said that they're actually changing their algorithm to be more focused on communities and community building and that actually this is the most effective way for people to consume content is to be connected with other people who are interested in the same things in a way where they can engage with uh, people who they consider to be either better than or worse than and have one person who's like the leader of the community. I mean, really, it's like you're nailing it. I don't know if you did that on purpose, but that's that's where Facebook's going. So good job. Well, what happened was is I just had so many people reaching out to me, and I was so consumed with I have to I have to message every single person. I have to make every single person feel like they're important, and it was becoming overwhelming with the hand histories. So I was like, I need to direct these people to one central place because I'm getting hand histories on Twitter, Instagram, email. And I'm like, okay, if you want to give me a hand history, you're going to post it here. <laughs> I love it. I think it's so smart. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. And thank you guys, of course, for listening. If you are listening on the audio, you can watch the full video version on YouTube. If you are watching right now live with us on YouTube, you can listen to the rest of the podcast. You can get us at the Booker News Podcast on iTunes. Thank you so much, Johnny Vibes. Thank you, Auntie Chardonnay.